Ever wonder what stuff gets used at a live gaming table? Let's go through the stuff at my table right now. Way back in the bad old days when I started playing role-playing games, back in the early 90s, we didn't have nice things. There were no nice things to be had. We had dice, and we had character sheets, and maybe we had a Mountain Dew if we were lucky, but that's about it. Today, we are spoiled for choice. The market is inundated with tools and gizmos and gadgets and things that are there supposedly to make your game better. Some good, some less than. Today, we're going to take a quick tour through all the gizmos and gadgets and stuff that we use at my table. Stuff that's all chosen for its usability and effectiveness, many of which I made. Here are some other details that are probably pertinent to this discussion. Details about my table that may not be the same at your table. I have a lot of players. We usually run four to six. Sometimes we run a heck of a lot more than that. When you get six players together, all the table, with all their stuff, it gets messy. So things that we don't use get pushed out. Furthermore, all of these things have been iterated on quite heavily for the last three or four years, the length of time we've been playing this version of this game. Things that make the game clear, we keep. Things that make the game less clear, we get rid of. Many of these things aren't things that I made up. They're things that I picked up from other GMs, other tables, some blog posts, streams, wherever. Wherever I could find it, really. And things that help my game be better. The hope is that something in here will help your game be better, too. So let's begin. First up is the table. And yeah, that's a tool, too. I bought it for this purpose. We play there. This is a 4 foot by 6 foot table of Ultimate Gaming from the Kickstarter several years ago. Plainer and fancier ones are available today. The tops come off to reveal a recessed gaming surface, which we don't actually use anymore. We found it to be too low and too cramped, and too hard to reach miniatures in the middle. In my particular case, it was really hard to reach over my GM screen to move things around. We also found it really hard to write on the remaining 6-inch armrest, the rim that's left over when the leaves are taken out. Many character sheets were bent and terribly mangled. I do really miss rolling on the neoprene, though. I'm fairly sure that some of you have already noticed that the lighting in there is really crap. It's terrible. There are no lights in the ceiling, at least no usable lights. Since a really big part of playing tabletop role-playing games is reading and writing very, very small text, I bought a bunch of lights. These are basically the cheapest torch lights I could find. I also exclusively use daylight LED bulbs. They're way less expensive than they used to be, and you can buy them in bulk at the hardware store. These are especially good if you have really bad eyes like I do. If you want to buy some of these, I'll stick a link in the doobly-doo. Next up is my GM screen. Since I designed my own game, there wasn't an off-the-shelf version I could use. There's been some controversy over using GM screens, mostly around fudging die rolls. I almost never do this. I prefer to let the dice do the talking. I mean, that's why we roll them. This guy is mostly for reference, and it's tailored to the stuff I need the most. I find it way easier to look things up on the GM screen than I do to look it up on a laptop, even if I have access to a search function. I also hide miniatures for future encounters behind the GM screen. This is way better than trying to find them during the game. It's also good for hiding cards with stat blocks on it, other tools, your drink, your mess, you know, the stuff. The really cool thing about making your own GM screen is you can tailor it to your needs. Facing me is game reference and maybe some post-it notes, whatever thing's going on that day. Facing the players is pictorial reference for the races in my game. I can say that the Dagarim are a canine race all I want, but if I can point at a picture at the back of my GM screen, that's way better. This is my player's guide. Again, I have no off-the-shelf solution. This is good anyway, because I don't have to muck around with this giant tome. It's full of common reference that players need. Like my GM screen, the other side of this is a bunch of reference pictures for the races in my game. These are basically legal-sized pages, printed through my printer on both sides. These are then saddle-stitched with a special stapler. If you want to make one of these at home, do yourself a favor and make a collation reference with the number of pages you want to include. Every character has a character sheet. Most of these I fell out for the first time anyway. Every character also has a moves list. My game's a little bit complicated, and so having this stuff all printed out with all the associated math is really, really helpful. Next up is everybody's favorite rolling devices. I have lots of dice. You probably do too. This is a really good idea. A lot of times players will come to the table without dice. It's good to have backups. My game doesn't require a ton of dice. Other games do. It's even better to have more dice then. Besides, then you get to buy more dice. We all like buying dice. If your players are like mine, they have a really hard time keeping the dice on the table. This is a rolling box. I have a lot of these. This one's mostly made out of foam. Textured, too. This is a dice tower. This one's made out of Lego. Supposedly, if you have really, really badly weighted dice and you put them through a dice tower, it will even out their bad rolls. I don't know if this is true, but I like to believe it is. 
Want to crank up the awesome one more notch? You can build dice towers that are themed to your characters. I built a bunch of these last campaign. They were a really big hit. Oh, and pro tip, these have no bottoms. You roll the dice on them, pick it up, and they're easier to deal with. One really bad thing about my game is we have to keep track of a lot of stuff. To make this easier, we use poker chips. That's good hands. The trays mean they don't get spread all over the freaking table. And from where I sit as a GM, I can easily tell how beat up the player characters are, which is really nice. It's less mental math for me. Another really nice thing is I can tell when the players aren't paying for their abilities. It's worth noting that this game is designed to be played with chips in these very small numbers, because it's way easier to drop things out of the bin than it is to keep track of this stuff on paper. How many times have you been at the table and you've forgotten a status on your character? Maybe it's a poison, maybe it's a disease, something that affects combat, who knows? Wouldn't it be really cool if we had something on the table to mark that? That's where these come in. These are basically colored plastic rings. You can find them online, sometimes called status rings, sometimes called condition rings. These I got free with my favorite beverages. They're free. It's your money. Spend it how you like. Putting the ring on the table is only half the problem. You still have to keep track of how many rounds the thing lasts. That's what this is for. This little doodad is built out of Lego. It's got slots on this side. It's got bins on the top. You put a die or a spin down from your favorite card game in the, in the bin, and you take it down every round. You write on the card what the thing is. In this case, it's haste on good hands, which is terrifying. When the effect is gone, you take the die out, and then I as a GM can know that there's no effect there anymore. Handy. It's worth noting that a spin down and a die 20 share the same shape, but they are very different devices. The next number on a spin down is next to the current one. The numbers on a die 20 are distributed for randomness. And it's worth noting that you don't have to build this thing out of Lego. The first version of this was made out of cardboard. Next up we have dungeon tiles. You don't strictly need these, but I find they're really good for marking out the play area. I started with a bunch of stacked cardboard with printer paper pasted on top. They worked, but they weren't elegant. Since then, I've gotten my crafting game on. These are my new dungeon tiles. This is a Wylock tile, which is mostly made of cardboard, painted to look kind of like stone. And this is a Black Magic craft tile, which is mostly made out of foam and painted to look like stone. They lock together. This is just a simple piece of cardboard. It's not that complicated of a mechanism. There's a little slot that it goes into. I think that's a lot easier than using magnets, which raise the cost of these things from a couple pennies to, I don't know, a lot more. Before we move on, I want to talk a little bit more about the Wylock tile, this guy. These walls are short. That's on purpose. This is for two reasons. First, players can see what's going on here, which is great, especially when you have a very large table like I do, or a lot of players like I do. The second part is it's easy to move things around. If you've seen other, I don't know, expensive things, they tend to have really tall walls, which looks cool on the table, but it's way harder to play with, and all I really care about is playability. These days I find myself using the unwalled versions more often. For one, they store a heck of a lot easier. For two, they're a lot easier to put together at the table. As an added bonus, the foam picks up texture a lot better than cardboard does. Maybe we'll make these in a video. Wouldn't that be cool? Next up we have clipboard and pencil, which is how I do pretty much all of my combats. If you want a little bit more information, Blam. I tried all kinds of stuff to make this easier. I tried building programs. I tried printing things out. This is what worked the best. Sometimes simplicity works. I don't think you can run a tactical game without miniatures. I'll do a whole thing on minis at some point. It's like a rite of passage or something. Mine are slowly being painted, but first, I'm a crap painter, and second, I'm really busy. Players typically don't care, and for my game, all we really need to know is position and orientation. And I'll throw in a pro tip here. If you watch a lot of painting tutorials online, a lot of it's coming from wargamers. What a wargamer wants to do is have a big unit of dudes that all look more or less the same. Our problem is different. While I like it when my miniatures look cool on the table, what I really want to be able to do is tell them apart. If I can't tell them apart, I don't know which damage is going to which guy. That's a problem. That means your combat's messed up. How many times have you watched a stream where they couldn't tell the monsters apart? I hereby give you permission to paint your minis different colors. We don't have to paint like wargamers. If you don't want to lose the cool points and you don't want to paint your minis different colors, that's okay too. Paint the bases different colors or wrap colored tape around them. In my opinion, function is way more important than form. Next up we have vinyl maps. These are easily obtainable at your favorite online gaming store or your favorite brick and mortar gaming store. Mine are wet erase. I've been collecting them over the years. You don't need any real artistic ability to use these. All you really need is a bunch of chisel tip markers to mark things unambiguously. It's okay to put tokens down on a map with drawn features. Imagination will always carry you home. This is one of my laptops. 
It carries a bunch of adventure notes. It also has a bunch of world and other background info, a bunch of maps and places and legends and whatnot. Basically all the reference that doesn't fit on the GM screen that I don't use all that often. It does have two really important things on it though. The first is a clock, so I know when to let my players go home. It's also really good for pacing. The second really important thing is a list of random names. Mine is organized by culture. I generally don't like to over-prepare stuff, and those pesky players like to talk to random folks in town anyway. With this table, I'm never far from a reasonable sounding name. Every character that gets to make a die roll gets one of these. This is how I do my stat blocks, and I sure hope that's in some kind of focus. Anyway, that's Reef. She's really cool. These probably look more complicated than they actually are, but take it for granted that I've iterated over this for many years and it's gotten pretty much where I want it. Also note, my stats are in different colors. This makes it way easier to read. You can do this for other games too. All right, we are on the home stretch. I always have one of these at my table, some kind of notebook and some kind of writing utensil. I especially need to write down stuff that I've improvised at the table because I will super forget. As an added bonus, if I have inspiration at the end of the session, I want to write it down while it's still fresh in my mind. Because chances are good we're not playing next week. My live game plays every couple weeks. I especially like this form factor because it will fit in a pocket and I don't have to lug around a laptop or something if I want to take it with me. Two more things about this dude before we go. First, I find it way easier to draw in here even though I have a fancy pen laptop. Most of my maps end up in something like this. The second thing is, this form factor is a little bit hard to work with if you're a lefty like I am, but you don't have to go front to back. You can go back to front. It's okay. I gave you permission. All right, now we're onto the miscellaneous stuff. I pretty much always have a calculator at my desk because my game is really math heavy, and at the end of the day, after a few drinks, it's hard to do math. I also usually have a bunch of these at my table. This is a sand timer. This one's 30 seconds. These are easily available at your favorite online store, and they come in all kinds of different denominations. Every once in a while, I'll use these for a puzzle that needs some, some kind of timing, some kind of real world timing. But most of the time I use it to get my players to go faster. Want your player to go faster in combat? Drop one of these down in the middle of their combat round. They'll get the hint. Last up, I have my comically oversized die six. This one's made of wood, and it's really freaking heavy. I use this for threat timers, a la Runehammer Games. I hope you found something useful in there that'll help your game be a little bit more awesome. Got any tips and tricks? Drop them in the comments below. Thanks for letting me show off my toys, and shoo, I'll see you on Sunday. Mm -hmm.